Thank you all for coming to our uh, One Book, One Marin 2008 celebration event. Uh, One Book, One Marin is not unique to Marin County. It's become practically a phenomenon across the country. More than 50 cities and county in counties in California alone host One Book, One Marin events. So many of us love to read, and we love to read books that inspire us, and then we enjoy discussing those books with friends and with family and with neighbors and with strangers. Our local libraries and our community partner organizations are proud to provide opportunities for people to do that, to come together around books, to build community and understanding um, through these shared experiences of the books. And this year, our One Book, One Marin project included nearly 40 events across the county, uh, engaging more than 1,000 people in reading and discussing and building community. And we're so excited that Amy Tan and Michael Krasny are going to be with us tonight to talk about our 2008 selection, Saving Fish from Drowning. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to thank the many people who made this initiative possible. And um, I'm going to read long lists of names, and it isn't the most exciting thing in the whole world, but these people are really important to us um, because they made this whole project possible. Our sponsors provide funding that allows us to offer free events um, to all our communities, and we want to thank them for their generosity. And they include the Dominican University of California, the Institute for Leadership Studies, uh, the Honorable Steve Kinsey and the Honorable Charles McClashen, uh, Autodesk, Book Passage, the Marin Community Foundation, the Marin Education Fund, the Friends of the San Rafael Library, and the Friends of the Marin County Free Library, the Belvedere Tiburon Library Foundation, the Friends of the San Anselmo Library, Comcast, the Marin Theater Company, the Marin Independent Journal, and the Marin County Free Library, which I represent. Um, and then we have community partners. And these, part, these organizations provide us with their staff time and their expertise that make One Book, One Marin happen. And these include the Belvedere Tiburon Library, Book Passage, Dominican University, the Larkspur Public Library, the Friends of the Nevada Libraries, the Marin County Free Library, San Anselmo Library, San Rafael Public Library, the Marin County Free Library, the Marin County Library Foundation, the Marin Education Fund, the Marin History Museum, the Mill Valley Public Library, the San Anselmo Public Library, and the San Rafael Public Library. I think maybe we have a theme here that librarians in this county are really invested in, in, in encouraging our citizens to read. I also want to acknowledge the educators throughout Marin County who have encouraged their students and parents to read the selection both in English and in Spanish and to thank them for their work in um, making reading a lifelong pleasure for their young adults. And lastly, I would like to thank just a few special individuals. Frank Gundry, whose photographs of Burma were displayed in the Fairfax Library and are being shown here tonight, and Kirsten Burzon of Dominican University of California for her great attention to detail around this evening's program, and Lori Earp, who was our event coordinator, and her staff. Uh, before I conclude, I want you to let you know that although we're celebrating our selection this evening, there's going to be continued programming throughout the year. And then we're going to make our 2009 selection in the fall. We'd love to keep all of you informed and engaged, so please leave us your information with the staff in the foyer space as you leave this evening, if you haven't already. One Book, One Marin is our community's opportunity to read and discuss and build community and the libraries of Marin County, our sponsors, and our community partners look forward to providing this wonderful opportunity to you. And next, I would like to thank and introduce Elaine Petricelli, who's the president of Book Passage. Her assistance, advice, and experience have helped our project immeasurably. So I'm really proud to introduce you tonight to Michael Krasny and Amy Tam. Thank you all. Good evening, and thank you for being here. Um, somebody was asking me before we went on stage here uh, how long I've known Amy and how well I've known Amy, and I've been fortunate enough to uh, be friends with Amy for many years. We have been involved annually in the Kidney Foundation Literary Luncheon. Uh, this year I was one of the authors, but I've been the MC for many years, and Amy is sort of the bulwark behind it along with Ann Getty. And I should also mention, because it's out there in public in my book, that we once uh, were in a hot tub together at Esalen Institute. <laughs> and I say that because this is, after all, the county of hot tubs. Um, 
And if you read my book, you know I used to do a program called Beyond the Hot Tub. That's true. Barbara Boxer at the time was doing little editorials called Boxer Shorts, however. Uh, in fact, there's a character in Amy's novel that we'll talk about who has a Marin County identity and even a Marin County disease. But before we get into talking about the novel, I wanted to pick up on something Elaine Petricelli said about Burma, Myanmar, which is very much in the news now, which is certainly the setting in Saving Fish from Drowning. Amy, though some of you may not know this, and I really think this deserves applause, uh, was singularly responsible for bringing together a lot of what I would call literary star power after Katrina at Book Passage. And for three days, money was raised and $48,000 was sent to the victims of Katrina and the people who have suffered as a result of Katrina. And I really think that that, as I said, deserves a round of applause. <laughs> I give a lot of credit to Elaine for that. She got everybody there. So. Well, it's a good segue, though, humanitarian that you are, to talk about what's gone on. I happened to talk about Burma this morning on my radio program, and there were a lot of analogies made to Katrina. But this is such a repressive military regime, by contrast, although some think that we live under similar circumstances. <laughs> we won't go there. But talk about what your feelings are in the wake of this really extraordinary, the worst tragedy since the tsunami and tens of thousands of people dead and homeless. It's horrible. I think my, my reaction is the same as, as many people. You, it's a horror and a helplessness, and it's that feeling of um, wanting to help, but how can you help? It's worse in this situation, as you said, because you have no idea how you can get help there. Will the government there, in fact, accept anything from the United States, from individuals, from relief organizations? Um, and it is that very question that led me to write this book. When you see suffering in another place and um, among strangers, what do you do? You have great sympathy, you have compassion, but what is the next step? And often, without knowing what that is, it, as I would often do, just that would be the end of it. Um, so well, you did that, have some misgivings about going to Burma initially, didn't you? I did. I mean, when I heard that um, there was a, a tour that was going to Burma with some friends, and I thought, this is wonderful. Burma is obviously, the conditions there are better, and um, they're allowing tourists there. But I found out now that, in fact, things were, if anything, worse. And people said to me, well, if you go to Burma, it's, uh, you are basically agreeing with what the government has done there. And I thought, oh, yes, of course, they better not go. Um, but then I realized, no, that really has nothing to do with how I feel about Burma. What do we do in situations like that? If, if I were not to go, that's a very simple way of addressing this moral issue. Um, I can just go to Vietnam, or I can go to Bali or something instead of, you know, it's not going to really be that much of a sacrifice for me. Um, so I really had to think about what one does in uh, a situation like that, when you feel there's something wrong, there's something morally wrong, and what is your moral response? Part of it also was no one had the answer for me, and I didn't have the answer for them. I couldn't tell you, you should go to Burma, you shouldn't go to Burma, you should give money, you should do this, you should demonstrate, you, should, you know. These answers were so personal. But you got an answer in part from Aung San Suu Kyi, the Nobel laureate, didn't you? In a way, um, I had heard that Aung San Suu Kyi was who was the rightfully elected president of, of Burma, um, who was, has been under house arrest, more or less, um, since her um, election or ouster. She had asked people to boycott going to Burma. And um, a number of people did. But also, she allowed the, the boycott really has not resulted in moving this intractable regime. But she, I heard her say that people could come to Burma if they had that attitude of wanting to help Burma. So I took it to mean if you were going there just to find a bargain with trinkets, that maybe you weren't of the right mind to go to Burma. But if you were going there with compassion, with a sense that maybe you could help, that that was indeed a good thing. So that trip, 
served at least in part for the inspiration for this novel, but it was also a true story about some tourists disappearing. Hmm? Not exactly. <laughs> I know. There, um, there was a story um, years ago, and it was, it was a peculiar story for a couple of reasons. One, there was uh, a group of Karen uh, who, who believed that they had two little boys who were deities. They were you twin Karen gods. Karen the tribe in Burma. Yes, the and the tribe was called um, God's Army. And it was a f these, these people who were in the jungle, and they faced adversity, and they believed that the, the children had this power to confer invulnerability to bullets and all kinds of things, which reminded me of what the boxers um, had also believed during the boxer uprising in China, that they had people who were deities who gave them this power. And I thought, this is so common among people who want some kind of hope when they feel so repressed and so helpless. They need to have this belief. And the, this group of uh, God's Army took over part of a hospital, and I believe it was in Thailand, and they held some people hostage. And it had a very bad outcome with some of the people from that um, God's Army group. Uh, being killed. I thought of a story in which if those people taken hostage had been Americans, it probably would have been front page news and you would have heard about it a lot. And there was enough about it that seemed familiar of people disappearing in certain countries. And so I thought um, this would be a story of people who went there all with mixed intentions of why they wanted to go to Burma. and. Uh, and it was not really clear. There's a lot of things that are never clear in stories, and it's true with this. The actual facts of the story may be one thing, but the, the truth of something is variable, depending on who's looking at it. So in this case, you don't know, where, did they disappear? Was it their fault? Were they really kidnapped? Were they willing victims? Were they glad they were there? Were they there to help? And it's a, it's a mixture of all those things. It is a mixture indeed. In fact, uh, I must tell you, I was just reading an essay by Gish Chen, Chinese-American writer, with whom I'm sure you're familiar, and she was saying, when you read my work, it's sort of like sweet and sour, you know, <laughs> or yin-yang. Uh, in other words, you get some of both. Uh, I don't know if that concept ever has struck you in your own work, but it certainly applies, doesn't it? I think it's, it, I think it's in most people's work. that There's a surface, and there is there are other layers. And so you can look at it both ways. It's a humorous book. It's a comic book. And, and people say, how can you use humor? It's such a serious subject. This is a terrible thing that's going on in a country. How can you make it a comic novel? And I thought to myself, in the, in the past, when I would read these stories, and I'd see these stories, one after the other, that are, are heart-numbing, that I didn't want to read them anymore. And what I wanted to read was something lighter. And I thought, well, what would have gotten me into a story about Burma maybe would have been something that I, just lured me in. Maybe it was a recipe about food, or maybe it was you know, something about travel, or maybe it was something funny, adventurous, and I would have gotten into it. And by then, I would have been stuck. And I would have to stay there, and I would get to know these people, and I would have a great deal of fondness for where I had been and the people I had met, and then I wouldn't be able to leave so easily. Um, there's a good deal of humor, uh, and let's talk about that, because a lot of it's satiric humor about American tourists uh, using uh, rather important artistic uh, shrines as urinals, things of that sort. Um, Which actually happened. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, we all say that with our novels. But it's not only the, the, the set, I mean, it's clear that you're having some fun. It's satire a la Evelyn Waugh, but I also thought of Chaucer, because you've got these people who are making a pilgrimage, and mm -hmm. Chaucer is you know, one of our greatest ribald humorists of all time. Yeah. Was there an influence there? Yeah, there was. Um, I actually had always wanted to write something that was inspired by um, Chaucer. And I, I, in fact, I tried to do that with the Joy Luck Club. You know, this idea you'd have this Rashomon point of view with different people going on a journey, having something in common. And um, that one, it turned out to be just four mothers and four daughters, only eight people instead of 12. <laughs> I needed 12 people to go on a journey. And so this is what that was. They were going on a, on a tour, but it was like a pilgrimage. They all had their different reasons. The Chaucer's tales are a lot, to, uh, Canterbury tales are a lot about um, 
morals, about people's versions of morality, which are hilarious in many ways, the way they interpret it. There is also a character in um, Canterbury Tales named Harry Bailey. And he is the, I think he's the innkeeper, or the barkeep at the place where the pilgrims stop for the night. And he just thinks their stories are great, and he wishes he could go along. Well, Harry Bailey becomes the name of the character of the guy who gets left behind. So he's one of the tourists. So he got to actually go part of the time. But what Chaucer didn't have, which Amy Tan has, is uh, a narrator who's deceased by the name of B.B. Chen. Um, immediately, people may think, uh, ah, Desperate Housewives or something of that sort. But it's a tour de force to decide to create a character who has died, and mysteriously died, a murder, in fact, uh, and have her as the narrative voice. I mean, that's a pretty risky thing to do for a writer. Yeah, it, it is, for a number of reasons. Um, one is that people, if you use ghosts, so to speak, people don't take you seriously. Or you know, you might be seen as somebody who has chosen a very easy device, a contrivance in fiction. But I had a number of reasons for doing that. And it's always my personal reasons that are the reason why I ultimately do something. Um, I needed a point of view. And in every story, we have a certain way that we look at things that are, is going to be different from how somebody else looks at it, and very, um, a varied way to look at the same situation. I wanted this person to be very biased in a way, very opinionated. Um, and you could also see where her biases might come you from. You succeeded. Yes. And that this person would also have some need some motivation, some loss of knowledge, some need to have this knowledge. And so I needed that character. And the character had to have an omniscience in a certain way to know the thoughts and feelings of other people as well as what was going on in that country. And the only way you could have um, you know, some omniscience would be you know, a character who's god or psychotic or something like that. Or, um, you know, so it, it, I needed all of those things, and so I chose a ghost, a very opinionated ghost. Ghosts play an important role in your oeuvre, in your body of work. And in fact, um, whenever I read you, I'm always mindful of just the recognition. You don't necessarily call them ghosts, like Maxine Hong Kingston does, for example. But I'm drawn to the fact that you are drawn to ghosts. Tell us. I, um, I have uh, several minds about that. Uh, part of, I have a, a scientific mind that says, no, of course not. Ghosts are manifestations of hope or desire and loss, um, often a manifestation of grief. Ghosts are some kind of physical ph phenomena that you certainly can't explain at the time, but there's a reason why you might associate that pounding of the stairs, you know, feet down the stairs as being a ghost as opposed to a carpenter, you know, who happens to be working in your house or... But I have a mother who believed in ghosts and she inculcated this awareness of spirits possibly being at work in my life and so I can't dismiss that as well. Ultimately, I've come to believe in all kinds of things, that it's not always ghosts. It may be the carpenter next door, um, or you know the dragon dancers with their drums. Um, it may be that kind of thing going on. Um, it could also be um, my mistaking something to be uh, a ghost or a, you know something else that's going on. But it could also be that there is some very loving spirit that is either causing some comic relief in my life or some very wonderful help. Um, one of the, the, when I look at the question of ghosts is, it, for me, it's why would I want to believe that it is a ghost, a spirit, uh, an entity that doesn't have a physical form in this universe, this existence? And it all has to do with love and hope and our own sense of mortality, the idea that the person we loved was so special that there's no possible way they could have disappeared forever, and that what you're feeling about them at some moment is obviously because their influence is still there. And it's the same thing, I think, with 
myself, the idea that whatever it is about me, how could it possibly be that I would not exist? I mean, this is, this is going to sound like a very vain thing to say, but you know, I think all of us at some level feel we are special, that there's no one else in the universe who is exactly like us, never has been before us, never will be afterward. And how could it be that that very special essence would never exist again? And so there's that part of me um, that, that sees um, a desire to believe in a world or perception, a dimension beyond the one we physically but the scientific understand. part of you doubts and denies? Or? Well, I, I take this, the scientific part of me just believes in string theory in which there are, you know, 11 dimensions that can occur simultaneously, and one of them includes these, these other. I've met physicists who think string theory <laughs> is like believing in ghosts, but we won't even go Yes, there. yes, no. no. Well, you also have, for example, what about curses? I mean, they play an important part in this novel, too. The curses there, um, in my mother's belief, there were curses that might have been the result of uh, angry ancestors, um, malicious forces, but that there was always a cause. And I think that curses often have to do with looking for reasons that people don't understand, accidents, um, diseases, misfortune, that there has to be a reason. If you know the reasons, then you can avoid them in the future, or at least make explanation for how something could have happened. When a child dies, or a parent dies, or a loved one dies, you need to have a reason. I mean, it can, can't just have occurred. We all keep looking for those. And in some cases, people will believe that after we start counting how many things have happened, that there's a curse. Whatever the cause of those curses are, maybe that'll vary from person to person. Um, so I think curses, both curses, ghosts, all of those things have so much to do with our own desires, our own needs and fears. Um, our and unconscious that, as well, you say? Well, if our unconscious is the combination of those needs and di desires and histories that we've had, that we've grown up and that have been placed in us by our parents who had their own histories and desires and fears, yes, I think um, that's all part of it. What I've come to believe, and I never, I, I don't like to call things superstitions that people have. Superstitions is what I think that you believe is kind of ridiculous, you know. And um, so different beliefs, and the beliefs uh, make no sense to some people, and they, but I think many of them originate from a similar, a similar place, in uh, either psychological place, or emotional place. And I think a lot of it has to do with emotions. Those emotions you feel in your gut, especially fear. You see why you cannot argue logically with so many people about issues. It, they have it in their gut here. Their beliefs are right here. And you're not going to move it. You know, there's no way that you're going to use this to, to change this. And I, I think that's what I like to write in my, my books, that sense of what's here in a person. And it manifests what's out there. You're reminding me of one of the stories in the Joy Luck Club where a mother loses her faith. In fact, the story begins with her using a Bible as a way to provide a table, uh, even as her levelness, uh, put it under the, under the leg that's broken. And she loses her son in the course of the story. I don't want to s spoil the plot. Well, I guess I just did. But, um, <laughs> she, <laughs> but there's this force that they feel brought them to America as immigrants, this force that allows them to succeed. Um, and it's very tied in with Chinese culture. It's obviously a whole artifact as well as a whole kind of um, sensibility that we associate with Chinese culture. Well, I think the, the, the reasons or the force that brought them seems to be greater because when you have um, this a life that has a, an abruption, a, 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 a certain discontinuity from the past to the, the current situation. It seems much more of a greater force. But I think that's true with anybody. I mean, if you, you know, you're trying to think, well, there's a force that brought me uh, to the work that I do or the person that I'm married to or the kind of life that I have. Um, it just, with people who are immigrants, I think it often is more dramatic because of what they had to leave behind. And so the, the stakes are bigger. The force of going across an ocean 
of not speaking the language, of landing there and having ungrateful children, you know, leads to a much stronger force. Um, and, and for all those reasons, for all those sacrifices, the force has to be very strong in getting the kid to then realize what the force is and what they must do with it. Um, when you were saying that my mother or this mother in the book lost faith, she put the Bible under the table. She never really lost faith. That's what the story is about, that, that there's these beliefs that people have. And despite all the things that happened and didn't happen, despite everything she had done and the sacrifices she had made to undo this terrible thing, and it didn't, she didn't lose her faith. It was still there. I thought she was so disillusioned when she didn't see the ghost of her son like she thought she would. Yeah, she put it under the, she put that Bible that she believed in before under the table to balance the table, but she still wiped it clean. She, wiped, she paid attention to it. She wiped it clean. I'll buy your interpretation. Yeah. Um, Believe me, that's the right one. Uh, but <laughs> we, <laughs> it's, it's based on my mother who, who did everything to save my brother and my father from dying when they were dying of brain tumors. And she, she tried, you know, uh, feng shui people and faith healers and praying to God and going to ancestors and um, finding out what the curses were. She tried to undo all of this, and it didn't work, and they died. And she didn't lose faith, and it made me so angry that she didn't. I wanted her to give up because it, so, it was so painful. You know, it, the idea you have to, you can't, this hope, you know, futile hope. And I learned that there's no such thing as futile hope. Futile hope is what you have to have, even though the situation is irre irreparable. See, one of the things that makes that story even richer in my mind is the ambiguity that a reader could come to the conclusion, despite what the author says, because author intention doesn't... You're just not that. remembering it correctly, Michael. You <laughs> read it again, read it again. <laughs> well, but no, actually, when you mention the tragic loss of your brother and your father, both because of brain tumors, reminds me of something you once said about the kitchen god's wife, that you couldn't talk about, let's say, a father and a brother dying by brain cancer. You had to fic fictionalize that because it seemed too kind of in unlikely to have occurred. Well, the coincidence part was, was heavy. Uh, but also, if I were to write about it directly, I'd want to you know, insert the truth and make it even more ponderous somehow. And that doesn't make for good fiction. I if I could um, examine that freshly for myself as a writer, I would come to feel things about it that I never would have discovered if I tr just tried to stick to the actual details as I could remember them. Um, it was, um, my life seems so improbable in many ways. If I were to write it as, as fiction the way it is, it, it just, it seems, you know, people would say, this is, this should be in a story, it's so bad, you know, it's so fictionalized. Or it loses its elixir. You know, Philip Roth once tried to tell a story, he called the facts, just straight narrative of his life. It just didn't have the zing, it didn't have the life to it, it didn't have the vitality to it that fiction has. You know, I, I think mine is just so over the top. <laughs> it would be, you gotta make it fiction. So, I mean, I have a life with, just briefly to tell you, my father and my brother died the same year of brain tumors. And my mother, it turned out later, also had a brain tumor that started around that time, but hers was benign. You have three brain tumors in the same family. Um, that year that they died, uh, after my mother tried all these things with the ghosts and the feng shui and the faith healers, she took my brother and me to Switzerland. Um, we were this family that hardly had any money. Um, and she just sold everything and bought this ticket and took us to Europe. Two teenagers and a mother who didn't speak any languages there. She barely spoke English. And she had no idea where we were going to go to school, no idea where we were going to live. She just bought a car and we just started driving along these highways until she found a place to live. I mean, that's crazy. That's crazy. I mean, um, you kind of have to set it up really carefully if you were to use that in fiction. <laughs> you say, so that's, in, you know, that's, impos that's implausible. You know, Chinese women, it just, it just wouldn't happen that way. So, you I got arrested that year. I mean, there's so many <laughs> implausible things, you know, I mean. Well, uh, I teased yeah. the audience before about your Marin County fictionalized character, but... Uh, 
You want to tell you us? You mean, is that me? Who is No, who is the one in Saving Fish from Drowning. Uh, the woman um, who has, uh, shall we say, the, um, I'm trying to be clinical about this, the uh, um, memory glands that are much admired. <laughs> the memory glands. Now, I, you've got me stumped. I the had a woman who has the, the breasts that are admired. Um, the this is your character. I know, and why can't I remember what you're talking I thought about? She's from Marin County. Uh, she is. The one who brings the whole kit with all the things in. Oh, 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 okay. I'm glad oh, you remember. Okay, yeah. okay. <laughs> all right, yes, okay. Yes, yes, I'm sorry. The way you had described them there, I just, I had this. Well, this, that's uh, male fixations, I okay. guess. Okay. In the novel. I know, yes, novel. I didn't remember that part. <laughs> okay, yes. Yeah, yeah she, has, um, she has a fixation on uh, disaster and uh, emergencies and preparedness, which I have to some degree. And if our many friends, if our, there are any friends here in the audience, if I were to say it's a slight similarity, they'd laugh out loud. Um, that, the, yeah. <laughs> the little kit of, of, of things you take with you when you're traveling, which is actually quite handy. I've, I've been told by people. <laughs> People who laugh at me, and then they go on a trip with me, they'll have something go wrong. They'll say, oh, I've just stubbed my toe. And they, anybody have a Band-Aid? And I'll say, oh, and I have some antibacterial ointment. Would you like that, too? Oh, that's so great. And then somebody else will get a bee sting or something. Oh, I have this, you know, Benadryl. It's good for reducing. And then uh, somebody will have, uh, you know, all these emergencies, uh, you know, have a problem, hemorrhoids. Who knows, you know? <laughs> I have the answer. And it all fits in a little pack about this big. And people make fun of it, but after they've all come to me for help, <laughs> they think it's the greatest thing. So there you go. I'm not as bad as the woman who put together that list there, but just about, just about. Well, speaking of being bad about things and hemorrhoids, <laughs> this book is scatological in parts. And you, uh, you sort of take delight in that in a way, don't you? Well, you know, I was, in part of this book, I was thinking to myself, there, 12 people here, and they have 12 ways of looking at the world, and some of them are there for adventure, and some of them are there for love, and some of them are there to help the world, and some of them are there for art. And there's a boy, there's a boy there, and, um, and he's, he's young, and he's, he's kind of reluctantly there, but he wants to climb trees and do all kinds of things. And he's interested in things scatological, but so is this other guy who's, he's older, but he's kind of like the boy. So uh, I just had the scatological humor in there because it just seemed very real. <laughs> well, you had, very real for these You guys. had a, a, a really wide canvas in this, and it was clear you were having fun, but also taking on very serious motifs, and we can perhaps talk about those time permitting. But also I was struck by the fact that um, you, you really, it seemed, wanted to as I said, be satiric, and yet at the same time, deal with some very troubling questions about cultural misunderstandings, particularly. Well, I feel that it's very difficult to write about these things um, in a completely serious form because it verges on, um, it's easy to verge on didactic, um, sort of polemical talk, where, where it's obviously, um, there's a position you're, you're just veering toward. And, um, and all of the fiction is manipulated that way. Uh, and while I might have a, a strong base of beliefs um, where it certainly would go toward, I wanted it to uh, have a, a other points of view that would be comic and, and where you wouldn't, you wouldn't be taking it so seriously and resisting. You would more be lured in the same way that you're lured to something fun or a, a comedian who says things that are so inappropriate, but it's because they're telling the truth in one way. They are saying something that's unspeakable. Uh, and there were polemical things that you wanted to say about the uh, junta, about well, the military regime? Polemical to me would be when you have already taken the position and you thrust that and everything then becomes the argument in support of that. Whereas for me, a, a story that reveals a, a set of beliefs would be different 
or a set of parameters for looking at what you believe in. So in this, for example, I'm, I'm saying here's a bad situation. As to what's going to solve the situation, I don't have an answer. And at the very end of the book, there are all these fantastical, ridiculous, circumstantial, a variety of things that come together, none of which could be predicted that leads to a particular outcome temporarily. It's the same sort of thing that's happening today, that Burma disappears from the consciousness of many people for such a long time. And then something happens, the uh, unrest among the monks and uh, what happened when a number of them were killed. Um, and, then, and now this terrible uh, cyclone that has killed so many people. Burma is in the news, and you never know what's going to lead to their, their coming back into the consciousness of the world. One thing that I did notice that, you know, having them, having Burma uh, recently have two terrible things happen has made people more aware of Burma. And um, it's, it's even changed in the press. They used to, in the media, always refer to Burma as Myanmar, the name that the military gave it um, after they took over. And it used to say Myanmar, the country formerly known as Burma. If you asked anybody, and most people that you know, you know, I'm going to Myanmar for vacation, they would have no idea where you were going. And, and you realize this country and its problems has been lost to the world. Recently, when you read the stories about what happened with the monks, um, and also now with what's happened with the, the cyclone, um, it says Burma, cyclone in Burma, you know, monks in Burma, Burmese monks. So the New York, Times says, still says, New York Times still calls it Myanmar. Yeah. AP calls it, the AP calls it Burma. Yes, the New York Times will catch up. Um, <laughs> I'm, actually, I'm not saying that one is right or the other. There is a political position that some people have taken, and that is to continue to call the country Burma to, in a way of showing that they are not recognizing that the government that is there is legitimate, and thus the name that the government gave it is legitimate. But it's, it's interesting to me that people are using the word Burma now, and that when people read a story about Burma, they recognize what that country is. They recognize the circumstances. They, they have a, a feeling about that country. You want to hear a ray of hope that validates what you're saying about out of all this uh terrible tragedy. Some, well, this morning I had a couple of Burmese uh, journalists on talking about the aftermath, and there is a referendum, constitutional referendum, slated for this weekend, as I'm sure you know. And in the, in the areas that were devastated and are underwater out in the remote areas, um, the elections have been put off, elections, the referendum has been put off a couple of weeks, but it's a entirely uh, put up job by the military junta to give them legitimacy. And there's more dissonance because of the anger yeah. at the lack of yeah. response to this by the government. I mean, they could beat up monks, but they can't warn about a cyclone or they can't do what they're supposed to do when it's time to give rescue or help. Well, I think if you have nothing left, you know, you, you fear your life, but if you're, if you're going to lose your life anyway with the way things are, that, you know, at that point, um, people in, in greater numbers are willing to take those risks. Um, but it's, uh, I, I think about, what happened with my own family in China, you know, what, when people were demonstrating for democracy in 1989, those students out on the square, my family was praying that things would remain stable because they had already gone through the Cultural Revolution. And to them, yes, democracy was good, but if democracy was going to lead to unrest and another Cultural Revolution and, and death and torture, then they didn't want to have anything to do with it. It, it's a different reality living there, and, and I think that the people have not been able to rise up against what has been happening because of this fear that you don't want your child to suddenly be sacrificed and to be killed, or your mother, your, your grandmother, your, your husband and wife. Um, so many different reasons, but you, you reach that point where now it doesn't matter. You certainly, you surely will die no matter what happens. Then you're you know, you have to take action. Well, um, it, it brings me to another question of just about the role, as you see it, of politics in a novel and how <laughs> integral it ought to fit into the vision that comes across in the novel. Our mutual friend Barbara Kingsolver, as you know, is a great believer in bringing politics to bear in a novel. Where do you stand on that? 
I think novels have also always been, um, have served that uh, purpose, whether deliberately or circumstantially, that you had things like the Velvet Revolution going on that really mu very much, uh, you know, in the, uh, the days of, um, of Czechoslovakia, um, that those writers have really served a purpose to keep a certain thought and, and focus. Um, and then there are writers who feel that books, fiction especially, should do no other purpose than to serve a literary one. Where I fall on that is that I want, I want to feel. I, I, I want to feel a situation first for myself. If I can, can write a story well enough that you feel is, you might end up feeling about those characters as I do. If I feel deeply about those characters, if I use my imagination to the best of my abilities, then I will have compassion for those fictional characters. Those fictional characters seem very real to me, and they are very much based on people who are out there, strangers. And now, because of the way I feel about these characters, I feel a great deal of compassion for those people, the real people in that country, in that situation. And then it becomes political if I decide to take action. The book itself is not political then in, in terms of a direction that you must do this, you must now foment uh, unrest, you must now demonstrate, you must now go work in the jungles, you, um, or that the main focus is on a diatribe against the government there. The focus is on getting you to love the people. That to me is a form of politics as well. If you call that a political novel, then I'm writing a political novel. There are some who say, I wish Amy Tan were still writing about mothers and daughters. <laughs> and you say what? I was writing about mother and daughter. The, the character in the book, the narrator, is my mother. She's a ghost. My mother died that year that I started this novel. And I wanted her voice. Um, and I heard her voice. This is the ghost part, you know, where we're saying, well, you know, I don't believe in ghosts. But I, I would get this funny kind of help from my mother. And it could have been just my feelings about her, or, you know, whenever I needed, I needed some medicine, you know, that I couldn't find the aspirin. And it would just fall right in front of me from, you know, nowhere, just fall down there. Um, if I needed some help in some way, it would just be delivered to me instantaneously. So I, I was thinking about my novel and how much problem I was having getting going. And she said, well, I can help you write. And I said, no, no, you know. And she said, I can be, I can be like a tour guide. I can tell you what to see and what to do and what to, and, I was, and then I was saying, yeah, you know, she really could. She could be the tour guide in this book, and she could be dead. She could be a ghost. And she's so opinionated, and she says really inappropriate things. And so she'd be great. So I said, sure, help me. Come along. And um, so my mother is in that book. Um, there was another prototype for B.B. Chen, though, wasn't there? Uh, another prototype. Uh, aside from Daisy, your mother, uh, another woman that you had in mind who was actually a a woman, a Chinese woman, this is what, this may be urban legend, but. Ha, huh. um, another Chinese woman. A Chinese woman who was involved in the art world like Bibi Chen and who was a rich benefactress? Or no, they're, 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 well, they're, they're different people in the community who might embody those things, but I don't know of any dead ones. <laughs> um, that settles it then. Yes. I know of some, they're not dead. They're wonderful people who do a lot for the community, but. Um, I made up this woman, Bibi Chen, as a, a philanthropist, or a very wacky looking one with very thick butterfly eyelashes and, you know, this plate of hair that was gold and black, which I've never seen before, but I think it'd be a wonderful hairstyle and, you know, <laughs> feel free to use it if you want. Um, By the way, she, you change your hair. I like it. Oh, thank you. You know, in contrast to that horrible poster out there that was taken, a photo taken eight years ago. It's not me who chose the photo. I think it's terrible, but it's like bait and switch. You see the photo, she's so young, she's so... And then, you know, and then I come out on stage and say, she looks nothing like that. Um, yeah, it was not me that chose the photo. Um, my agent. It was not Dominican College's fault either. It was... Um, Anyway, I was, I was just saying the hairstyle and um, 
that story was um, one that was so preposterous. I thought it would be a clue to people that the story was not a narrator who possibly could have been real. And yet there were a number of people, including my friends, who, who remembered that story. They remembered that woman who was killed in the bizarre way, you know, and I thought this is the power of fiction. You can take, spin all kinds of things, and if you make it sound real enough, they'll actually believe it, which was, in fact, a concern of mine, and if another political concern or a psychological one or one having to do with beliefs. And that is, if you re read something or see something in a certain place, if you read the news or you hear it and see it on TV or radio, you believe it's true. And so, and, and, and depending on what channel you turn to, if you turn to Fox News, here's the truth of what's happening in Iraq. If you turn to this channel, PBS, you know, you would have a different point of view. And um, there's this tendency to um, take credible people like me. <laughs> and I can tell you there was a woman named Bibi Chen who died in a bizarre way. And she is now the narrator of this story. And um, it's amazing how many people trusted me. Or had I, I thought I had so little imagination, I would have taken the writings of a ghost and claimed it to be my own story. <laughs> the, the, the story along those lines, since we're in Marin, that I always liked and cottoned to. Remember Cyrus McFadden, many people out there probably do, who wrote the serial, a spoof of Marin County, life in hot tubs and peacock feathers and all the stereotypes. And there was a character that she completely made up out of whole cloth who was supposedly a Tiburon psychiatrist who met his patients in motel rooms and charged them for having sex with him, which was supposed to be therapy. <laughs> And, and a lot of people went to the same yeah. guy, right? <laughs> Claim they did. There was a guy who sued Cyrus, saying, I mean, you can imagine, or th excuse me, threatened to sue Cyrus, who said, this was obviously me. Now, who would want, you know? I know. So, anyway. Let, we've, just now, got, we've got a few minutes left, because we're going to go to the audience and take some questions. But talk about fate, because it is so important in this novel, and what you really wanted to I'll use your word, communicate about fate. About fate? About fate. Fate. Not faith, fate. I know. <laughs> F-A-T-E, yeah. about fate. Because you've got that epigram from Camus, which I was always struck by. Yeah, yeah. It made me think, also, this is another novel about fate, isn't it? Um, it's a novel about beliefs. And, you know, Camus, when he's talking about intentions, um, and then uh, there's a, an epigram below that that also talks about intentions. And it was looking at this idea that you could have intentions, but if they come out of ignorance or they are justified in a, a perverse way, that they're even worse than if you had set about to do something deliberately evil. Um, I had a hard time wrestling with that when I looked at in my life, intentions I may have had and things that had gone awry and then saying, well, my intentions were good. I have that uneasy sense when I write a book that I may be writing it for a particular reason or intention and that somebody might then read it and misinterpret what I have written and say that, uh, the, that I am purporting that all Chinese men have concubines or something. Um, how much responsibility do you take for intentions that go astray and lead to bad consequences. So I had a, a, this question about intentions. I've always had a question about fate. What is in our life that is, how is it determined? How are things determined in our lives? Is there anything truly that is an accident? Um, is there anything that is truly um, coincidence or luck? Or what are these things composed of? How is it that the outcome of it then is called fate? And, and so that, I think, is what I've been writing all, all along. My mother has been the conduit for a lot of those questions. She is, after all, the woman who most influenced the way that I think, the questions and the contradictions that I have. And it ultimately leads to this question of what how do things happen, and why do these ha things happen, and what are my beliefs about that, and how do my beliefs then affect what I do in life, and that what I do then, how does that continue to affect what I believe as a basis of what happens then? So it's this little continuous stream of, of anxiety and questioning and wonder and 
um, that is this question about fate. Intentions are the, the center of this book, Saving Fish from Drowning, but it ultimately is trying to answer that question of how do things happen, and why do things happen, and how do I make things happen. I want to say one uh, thing about the title? Saving Fish from Drowning is a saying I heard about with the Burmese fishermen, and it's a country of Buddhists. I, I would say 90% or more of the people there are practicing Buddhists. Um, the fishermen, they also don't want to accumulate a, la a lot of bad karma, so they, some have taken to saying they are saving fish from drowning, which may sound very cynical, but they say they are taking it out of the water, trying to save them from drowning. In the process of trying to save them, they, they didn't make it. Um, there's a saying, this epigram that alludes to that in the beginning of the book, and it's uh, by Anonymous, but Anonymous is really me. I had to put this epigram in there to also try to convey a sense of ambiguity there, which seems less ambiguous to, to some, that it was very cynical, or to others, it's the kind of unhappy justification we need to make when we know the outcome is going to be bad. And you only have to look at those two variations of interpretation and how we look at the world and what is going on in so many parts of the world today, how do we take look at intentions as cynical or as sad justification? Ladies and gentlemen, Amy Tan. Michael Krasny. Thank you, Michael. We're now going to... Uh, Take some questions, uh, and Elaine Petricelli is going to reside over some questions that you've put. Wow. Uh, I have several questions here from people who want to know how you became a writer. And do you have a muse, but really, how did this happen that you hmm. moved to where you are now? Because in Marin County, 250% of the population would like to be able to write novels. <laughs> well, the first, the first part of that is the library. I went to the library all the time. I, I check, would check out the maximum number of books from the time I was six years old. Or, um, I think that at that very early age, I read about a book a day. They were very short then, of course, but constantly reading. Um, I never truly believed or hoped that I would become a writer. Uh, when I was young, what I really hoped and believed I would become was a librarian. Because I thought that that was the job that would enable me to read. Um, but you wanted to be an artist, too. No, and then later, when I was older, what I wanted to be, that I, I thought I had a talent for drawing. So I wanted to be an artist an artist who drew and painted and all of that. And when I look back, it's, it's a similar way. You want to represent the world in your imagination and in your very specific viewpoint or voice. I think that part of becoming a writer has to do with those questions you ask yourself from the time you're very young. If you ask this question of how do things happen, which you have to answer as a novelist in the story, you have to answer how do things happen and why do they happen, you start noticing details in life. Um, we're all in the same consciousness of this book, which means Burma, so you're all aware now very much of things that are happening in Burma. And you start to pick out details of what you're noticing. You'll pick out details about Burma maybe somebody else is not paying attention to. Those are the kind of things that go into a writer's voice and ultimately leads to this desire also, I think, to express what you know and, and how you feel about the world that nobody else may think about or put in exactly the same way. Um, but I think it starts with a love of reading, of words, of stories, and it leads to, um, I think, the, the very worst reason for wanting to write is to is, is wanting to be published because that leads to a lot of frustration. So hard to get published. If you write for, it sounds like a cliche, but if you write for reasons that are going to be gratifying to you and satisfying to you no matter what happens, you probably will end up writing a much better book and improve your chances of getting published. And I have to say that Amy has 
been so generous with authors who are starting on the path that um, it's really something that we're all very fortunate about. Uh, several people have asked about The Bone Setter's Daughter, about the novel, and about the opera, how it is that you ended up writing a libretto. I got tricked. <laughs> I, um, I have a friend I met at an artist colony at Yaddo, and he's a composer, very, very, very talented composer named Stuart Wallace. He actually did an opera that played in San Francisco called Harvey Milk, and that was about 10, 12 years ago. Um, a friend, another friend, Serena Tang, had suggested to Stuart that he write a piece of music for me for my birthday. Now, ordinarily, he would have said, no way. I mean, it's like, you know, you say, hey, you know, my wife is having her birthday next week, and you write her a novel just for a <laughs> present. And it's like, please. So for some reason, he said, yes, this is all fate. OK, this is all these things that never should have happened. This is fate. And he said he would do it, and he did. And then he hadn't even read the book. So then he read the book, and he decided it should be an opera. And he kept bugging me about it. Finally, I said, fine, do whatever you want. And he had a librettist, a really talented guy. But, and they were going to go off and do it. I'd be there to you know, be kind of a reference, you know, quality assurance or something. <laughs> and, uh, and then the librettist was so busy. This, he was working on a Broadway play that suddenly got financed, Grey Gardens, really great. Broadway play, and suddenly he was really busy, and he couldn't work on the libretto, and Stuart got very um, panicked, and he said, can you just start something, just write something? And so I wrote some notes, and I, I said, I don't know how you write libretto, and I says, just write anything. So I wrote notes, and he, and he said, well, it's too long, and I said, well, it's not libretto, are there notes? And he says, no, this is libretto, and he just started striking out some of the lines, and he left everything in the same order, and he said, this is libretto. I said, well, if that's libretto, I could do libretto. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it was a very, it was a wonderfully collaborative process where we wrote it together. Most librettists, they'll write it first and they hand the, the libretto over and the, then the composer starts composing. But in this case, we were a tag team or we were working in the same room, going through the story, just re, redoing, recreating this entire story for opera not trying to shoehorn in an original story, but the heart of it then had to be recast into an opera. And we would be seated and talk through this, and then I'd say, OK, 20 minutes, I would write this little moment of music. And then he would look at it, we'd go through it together, and then he would write the music. And then he would call and say, I have, he'd want me to hear something. And there were a number of times he'd call me from, uh, like an airport, and he said, I just finished writing that aria. Do you want to hear? And I'd say, sure. And, I, and, he, and I'd hear something, you know, um, last call for, you know, flight <laughs> six. I'd say, Stuart, where are you? Oh, I'm going to get on a plane. And he starts singing. He sings in this beautiful baritone voice that I'm imagining people looking at him like, what? He's, he's in love with somebody. But then the, the song gets really distorted. And it talks about cursing you and this. I'm thinking, these people think this guy's a stalker now, <laughs> singing to me. But that was the kind of experience it was. And September 13th, our world premiere here at San Francisco Opera. So. So go to the premiere and then come here on the 21st of September and Amy will tell us all the dirt as she talks with Stuart. And, uh, well, actually, though, there will be dirt in a book by Chronicle Books coming out. It's called Fate, Luck, Chance. Great title. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the, the other will be a PBS documentary. And if you want to see a clip of that, go to sfopera.com and under Bonesetter's Daughter, you can click on a link and it'll, you'll see the documentary that's being made. And that brings me to another question someone asked, because, uh, and it seems to follow logically, do you write poetry? A libretto is certainly right. poetry. Do you? 
do much poetry? I, I don't. I've attempted to write um, prose poems, but I don't um, have the... Uh, there's a certain discipline to poetry, and I know it when I read it and I don't have that. Poetry is not the short form of a short story, and the short story is not a short form of the novel. They're so, so very different in their art forms and what they, and how they do it. Libretto is different as well. Even though the form seems to be more that of poetry, and the lines may scan in a way that would be more the, the kind of decisions a poet would make, libretto is there to serve the music. The composer is creating the world, and the world will be performed by these magnificent voices. The librettist creates an architecture, the story architecture, and provides the words. And the words should be you know, ones that forward the story and have emotion. But that is the primary purpose of the libretto. Whereas you know, poetry, it's all about me. You know? So it's very different. Uh, speaking of poetry, Michael, uh, has very generously agreed to moderate a poetry event that's coming up this month. Michael, would you mind telling us a little bit about that event that's coming no, up? No, not at all. Uh, I believe there will be three poets. Um, some names may be recognizable to those of you who like to read poetry or know of poetry. Robert Bly, first of all, is a name that's quite recognizable, um, especially during the period when many Marin men, myself not included, went out into the woods uh, <laughs> to embrace Iron John uh, and find the atavistic man within. Um, he'll be one of the poets featured along with Jane Hirschfield, who is a poet who lives here in Marin County and um, quite well known for her poetry as well as her Buddhist practice. And Ivan Boland, who is a wonderful poet from Ireland, who teaches at Stanford, in fact, I believe is now uh, full professor there in creative writing, but came here originally from the old sod. Um, and I'm also delighted to say that I'm going to feature those three poets along with Bob Hass, who also lives in West Marin and shared this year's uh, Pulitzer Prize for Poetry with Phil Schultz uh, on the radio program forum that I do uh, in the mornings. So it should be a, a appropriate feast for National Poetry Month. Thank you. Do you have the date? May? May 18th, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. I gave you all the information. <laughs> I gave you. May 18th, right. Sorry. Right here. What goes on in this hall is quite amazing. And speaking of that, moving from poetry, I have several questions here about the rock bottom remainders. People oh. want to know about your rock and roll career, Amy. Oh, these, these, this is the credential that enabled me to do opera. Um, <laughs> It's the other implausible fiction that I would ever be somebody who could sing in a rock band. Fortunately, the other people in the rock band are fiction writers as well. Um, Stephen King, Dave Barry, Ridley Pearson, um, Matt Groening, or Gro Groening as most people would pronounce his name. Does Dave um, Barry write fiction? Dave Barry has written fiction, Does yes. He? he has written also yes. this book, uh, that. Peter, um, that's modeled after um, Peter Pan. Mm -hmm. uh, with Ridley Pearson, um, and uh, who else is there? Greg Isles, um, our own Kathy Kamen Goldmark, who started the band. Um, Can you tell them about your attire in this band? Um, I, um, you know, play the tambourine, and I also, people ask me what instrument I play, and I say the whip. <laughs> and uh, I play actually the dominatrix. My, my title is um, the rhythm dominatrix. And in the past, uh, I, I had to wear this ridiculous outfit, and then, well, I still have to do that, actually. I, I was asked by our first musical director, um, Al Cooper, um, if, that I should sing this song called Boots. And, and that I learned, if you don't have a good voice, you can have attitude. And you can be ridiculous. So they picked a ridiculous song for me to have attitude with. And I wear this leather outfit with the cap, the policeman's cap, and the thigh-high boots, and the chains, and this whip I have, Cat of Nine Tails, that Scott Rowe gave me. 
At the end of the song, all the boys lean over and I whip them. <laughs> you know, and, and somehow it doesn't matter that I have a terrible voice. They just think I'm great. <laughs> this is not an invitation to anybody to meet Mistress no, it's Amy. Not. You know, the, I have to say, this is totally a fictional character that somebody came up with. But I have had people at meetings who've had a little too much to drink, at publishing conferences who, you know, some guy from Prague who came and says, you can come to my room and be my dominatrix. And I'm thinking, oh, gag me. Oh, <laughs> oh. you know. <laughs> and no, not my persona. So. And People used I, to look at Lou and say, oh, lucky Lou. You know? <laughs> Uh, I should point out that the band raises money for charity. Yes, yes, and, that is. And uh, several cards have asked, when is the band coming to Marin? I don't know that that's going to happen, but they do occasionally come to San Francisco. So. We were at the Fillmore a few years back. That, that's such an incredible fantasy to ever play in a, a venue like the, the Fillmore, but we have. We played in many um, venerable rock and roll halls. Hall of Shame, we have made them. <laughs> we played at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and at the, when it first opened in Cleveland. Um, we have raised, uh, I think, close to $2 million, most, most of them for kids' literacy programs, um, including 826. <laughs> no, you don't ha you, really, you don't have to applause for me because we do it for fun. And the charity part is just to assuage our guilt because we don't have a lot of talent. <laughs> Um, so it's really to uh, give applause to the people who actually paid to come and hear us, <laughs> see us. But 826 is one of the, the groups, and I would just encourage anybody, if you don't want to hear the band, just go right to 826 and give them money. Because they're a really great group. They will be next in Miami, November 13th, I think it is. So if you happen to be in Miami at the Miami Book Fair, you can find us there. As they say in the Michelin Guide, this is worth a journey. <laughs> and it's been a wonderful journey tonight and a wonderful year with Amy and Saving Fish from Drowning. You've been so generous, both Michael and Amy, and we can't thank you enough. And I know that Amy has generously agreed to sign your books if you have them. Uh, if you want to buy 10 or 20 more, there are copies of all of Amy's and Michael's books at, uh, in the foyer, and thank you all to the libraries, to everyone in Marin County who has made uh, this happen, and to Beth Ashley, who has done such a beautiful journalism about the one book, one Marin, and, and this book. So thank you all. Thank you.